On September 17th, 1944, one of the most daring operations of the Second World War took place. Paratroopers from three airborne units of Anglo-American forces, who had been consolidated into the newly formed 1st Allied Airborne Army, descended on several areas of East Holland, occupied by the Germans, in order to seize bridges over major waterways, thus opening the path for mechanized Allied forces to attack the rear of the German army. If all had gone according to plan, the outcome of the war would have been totally different. Peace might have been declared as early as December 1944. By the end of August 1944, the Anglo-American command had complete confidence in its victory. After fierce fighting in France, the withdrawal of German army units seemed to confirm Allied statesmen's predictions that there were few remaining Hitler troops until the end of resistance. The enemy had been driven into its lair, and only a final decisive step was needed to finish them off completely. From the perspective of today's events, it is hard to believe such statements. However, at that time, most British and American citizens believed that the war in Europe would be over in a few months. They had good reasons for that belief. The pace of the Allied offensive over the summer months has surprised even the most skeptical observers. When planning Operation Overlord, it was assumed that it would take at least six months to reach the French-Belgian border. However, this goal was achieved in less than 100 days. In addition to this, the success of the Soviet offensive in the Baltics and the Romanian campaign prevented the German army from transferring reinforcements from the east. By early September, Allied armies advancing under a broad front strategy had liberated southern regions of Belgium and the Netherlands, and even entered Germany, where they promptly halted. The offensive began to slow down due to supply issues. As is often the case, the supply trains could not keep pace with the rapidly advancing main units. Therefore, there was not enough force and means available to strike in more than one direction. This led to disagreements within the Allied command structure. As they say, everyone covered themselves with the blanket. Hit American General George Smith Patton Jr. and British Field Marshal Sir Bernard Law Montgomery, both of Alamein, presented General Dwight Eisenhower with original plans for the final defeat of the German army. Patton proposed that the best location for the final strike would be Metz, where he intended to break through the German fortification line, better known as the Siegfried Line. Montgomery, on the other hand, suggested avoiding a frontal assault on the German defenses by bypassing them from the north and liberating Holland before entering the Ruhr area, the main German industrial center. Berlin was just around the corner, and the second option could potentially solve the logistical issues that were becoming more and more apparent every day. Eisenhower eventually chose the second option. At a meeting of the Allied command on September 10th, Field Marshal Montgomery presented his plan to attack the rear of Germany, with the ultimate goal of ending the war by Christmas Operation Market Garden. The very name of the operation suggested two of its main components, the Market Phase and the Garden Phase. According to the plan, known as Market, parachutists were to land in a small area in the southeastern part of the Netherlands, on the Eindhoven Arnhem section. The ejection sites were located between 60 and 90 kilometers from the front line. The main objective was to capture bridges across the rivers Dommel, AA, and Meuse, as well as the Wilhelmina Canal and Musewal Canal, and further along to the Rhine River. Along these captured crossings, units from the XXX British Corps were to advance towards the German border from a bridgehead in Neerpelt on the northern side of the Meuse Scheldt Canal. This latter part of the operation is known as Garden. The American 101st Airborne Division, under the command of Major General Maxwell Taylor, was to land in the largest area, Eindhoven, which was almost 25 kilometers long. This sector was located north of the front line and was the most significant for the Allied forces. The 82nd Airborne Division, commanded by Major General James Gavin, was assigned to a smaller sector in the Nimigan area. In this area, which was approximately 15 kilometers in length, the Allied forces needed to take control of several important objectives. These included a large road bridge over the Meuse River, any of four bridges over the meuse wall Canal, and a road bridge over the Wall River in Nijmegen. Additionally, Gavin's troops were to occupy the Grosbeck Heights, a hill located southeast of Nijmegen, 
The northernmost and most remote area of Arnhem was to be cleared of German forces by the British Red Devils, led by Major General Robert Urquhart. The main target of the landings was the automobile bridge in the center of Arnhem, which was the last water obstacle on the path to Berlin. All efforts of the paratroopers were directed towards capturing and holding this modern structure that had been built in 1935 during the German occupation. The bridge had been blown up and rendered inoperable during the majority of the war. However, it was recently restored a few weeks prior to the start of the operation. It should be noted that each sector had its own unique characteristics, and the allocation of forces and equipment was therefore individual. According to plan, the paratroopers from the 101st Division were expected to link up with the forces from the XS X Corps within the first day. As a result, the number of troops stationed in the Eindhoven area was less than in other areas. In Nijmegen, it was crucial to hold the strategically significant Grosbeck Heights, so units from the 82nd Division were additionally equipped with artillery and engineer sappers. The British forces, who were expected to hold out for the longest, were several times larger than the combined forces of both the American divisions. In addition, the 1st Parachute Division received reinforcements from soldiers of the 1st Polish Parachute Brigade, under the command of Major General Stanislaw Sosabowski. Overall, it is estimated that about 35,000 soldiers were scheduled to participate in the operation. Prior to Market Garden, most major parachute missions were conducted during the night or early morning hours, when it was assumed that darkness would allow the paratroopers to achieve their intended surprise effect. However, following the Allied withdrawal from Normandy, the decision was made to reconsider this approach. Due to frequent pilot errors resulting in aircraft landing in the wrong locations, it became difficult to assemble troops on the ground at night. As a result, it was decided to land at noon. A large number of troops required an appropriate number of vehicles to carry them. Not only the soldiers, but also the equipment and cargo needed to be transported behind enemy lines. In order to do so, it was necessary to use all Allied transport aircraft available. The management decided that the only way to accomplish this task was to land in two waves. At the same time, nobody wanted to hear the arguments that some of the forces in the first wave would need to guard the area while the parachutist troops in the second wave performed their main task. That is, they would be inactive for one day. However, the main point was that the Wehrmacht, having suffered defeat and a lengthy retreat from France, was in disarray and would not be able to provide any significant resistance. Meanwhile, the Germans did not waste any time either. On Hitler's orders, the 1st Luftwaffe Parachute Army and the 2nd SS Panzer Corps were hastily formed and sent to the area where the Allies were expected to land. Although their combat training was not perfect, these units happened to be in the right place and at the right time, thanks to a fortunate coincidence. In addition, a few days before the attack, Wehrmacht units held live fire exercises to ensure that the soldiers would not get confused in battle. The British intelligence, however, did not want to acknowledge the German preparations, even though they received information from Dutch resistance members about the large number of tanks and soldiers in the Arnhem region. Official records show that on September 17, 1344 transport planes, 491 gliders, 1113 bomber aircraft, and 1240 fighter jets took off from different airfields to execute the Market Garden strategy. The second wave of troops, which began the next morning, consisted of 1,360 Dakota planes and 1,203 glider aircraft with tugboats. In total, 34,876 soldiers, officers, 568 pieces of artillery, and 1,926 vehicles landed in the enemy rear. During the operation, 5,227 tons of supplies were delivered to the locations of three airborne divisions. In order to eliminate the threat of air defenses on the night of September 17th, Allied bomber aircraft launched a concentrated attack on North German airfields, dropping more than 800 tons of bombs. In the morning, approximately 100 British bombers, along with fighter jets, attacked German coastal batteries located in the area where the proposed flight paths were. At 12.30 p.m., the first elements of paratroopers arrived in the drop zones. Scouts were to set up signal lights for gliders, and smoke bombs were lit and colored banners were spread out. Between 1 o'clock and 1.30 p.m., the main force was released in all sectors, 
For the German forces, the appearance of Allied paratroopers in the sky came as a real surprise. By 3 p.m., all landing forces had been grouped and started to carry out their tasks. The main British forces had landed in an area more than 10 kilometers away from their main target, the bridge over the Rhine in Arnhem. This meant that the time spent collecting troops and marching towards the target of attack had deprived the British of the main advantage of the airborne operation, the element of surprise. Half an hour later, the Red Devils encountered their first major setbacks. Radio communication had become unresponsive. Communications were lost with almost every unit. As the vanguard of the division, moving in jeeps towards Arnhem, a reconnaissance unit was ambushed on their way. The offensive of two other battalions also stalled. Only the paratroopers of the 2nd Battalion, led by Lieutenant Colonel Frost, managed to make it to their main objective, the automobile bridge at Arnhem, and began preparing for defense. At this crucial point, several 57mm anti-tank guns were quickly installed, firing through the bridge and onto the approaches on the other side of the Rhine. The second wave of the landing force landed at noon on September 18th and was unable to improve the situation. By night, German units managed to bring additional forces to the Arnhem area, forcing the paratroopers to take defensive positions. They eventually lost the initiative and retreated to a bridgehead in Osterbeck, on the north bank of the River Meuse on September 19th. Divided into two groups, lacking sufficient anti-tank weapons and at the cost of heroism, the paratroopers were able to repel a major attack by the 9th SS Panzer Division, while the Americans were doing better. Despite heavy fire, the 82nd Infantry Division's paratroopers managed to capture a bridge over the River Meuse near Grave, and, by evening, the bridge at Newman came under their control. However, due to the delayed arrival of the cleaning team in the landing area for cleaning adjacent areas, the main objective was not achieved. The bridge in Nijmegen could not be taken. In the Eindhoven region, units of the 101st Division successfully took control of a bridge near St. Uden Road and reached Vagel without opposition. At this point, after receiving news of the successful landing, Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks, commander of the British Army, launched an offensive with his forces, which outnumbered the German forces by a factor of two in infantry. At 2 p.m., 400 heavy guns opened fire on enemy positions. Half an hour later, a column consisting of 20,000 vehicles moved to the northeast. The British offensive followed a single route, as the terrain on either side of the road was impassable for tanks. However, Horrocks did not anticipate significant resistance from the German forces. In reality, things took a turn for the worse. The loss of one tank caused a traffic jam that halted the entire column. It took a significant amount of time and effort each time to clear the path and continue the advance. So on September 17th, the British only advanced six, eight kilometers with the vanguard of their corps approaching the southern outskirts of Eindhoven by the end of the following day. The slowdown in the progress of the ground troops put the paratroopers in danger. The situation for the 1st Division's units continued to worsen rapidly. On September 19th, during the afternoon, the British lost radio communications and scattered their forces, leaving some of their units without leadership or air support. In Arnhem, isolated groups of paratroopers had to fight fierce street battles. General Urquhart spent 36 hours hiding under fire in one of the city's lower attics. The actions of the British soldiers cannot be described as anything other than complete chaos. At that time, Allied ground forces made contact with American paratroopers from the 82nd Division in the Nijmegen area, forcing previously captured bridges across the Zuid Willemswart Canal and the Moose River. This allowed the Allied forces to only reach the Rhine halfway. A road bridge in Nijmegen was captured through joint efforts. The remaining German units retreated to the north and began hastily to establish a defensive line in the area surrounding the town of Elst. Within the first few hours after the bridge in Nidmegen fell, the 17 kilometers of terrain between Nidmegen and Arnhem were left practically unprotected. Only one anti-tank position was located outside of the town of Lent to block the road leading to the British tanks. However, the Allied High Command had received a radio transmission from the Dutch resistance about the critical situation in the area where the British landing was taking place. 
After pulling together all available forces, the British armored divisions prepared for the next day's final decisive attack against Arnhem, which they were scheduled to reach during the first day of the offensive. On the morning of September 20th, the Red Devils, under the orders of their division commander, began to move towards Oosterbeek in order to establish a defense area around the town. This prevents attempts to break through to the surrounded Frost Battalion, which holds the southern part of the Arnhem Bridge. General Urquhart's plan was simple, to control a stretch of coast about 2.5 kilometers in length, which could later be used as a base for an amphibious assault. Thus, the primary objective of the operation, the transfer of troops across the Rhine, would be achieved regardless of the outcome. However, this was not to be the case. After 70 hours of intense close combat operations, the remaining 120 members of the 2nd Battalion were still disabled from the Arnhem Bridge at the start of September 21st. The speed competition had started. While the German commander, General Model, focused all his efforts on eliminating the 1st Airborne Division, until the forces from the 30th Corps came to their aid, the British continued to attack his defenses in the Nijmegen area, trying to break through and reach their paratroopers at the bridge and occupy the Osterbeck bridgehead. In order to strengthen the units fighting near the city, that same day, the 1st Polish Parachute Brigade was deployed near Elst and Drill. The weather conditions allowed for the disembarking of approximately 1,000 soldiers. On September 23rd, the situation in the Arnhem sector was largely unchanged. The paratroopers' forces were dwindling. However, they continued to vigorously repel German attacks. In the afternoon, planes carrying supplies for the 1st Parachute Division appeared in the sky. It was the last large-scale transport flight. After losing eight aircraft, the pilots did little to aid the paratroopers. Most of the dropped supplies went to the Germans. However, after a week of uneventful fighting on both sides, the British leadership abandoned plans to maintain the bridgehead at Osterbeek. On September 25th, Captain Urquhart was ordered to evacuate his positions by night and cross the river to Nijmegen. Crossing the Rhine took place in landing boats during the night. Operation Market Garden came to an end on September 26th morning, when after eight days of intense fighting, 2,400 weary soldier, the remaining forces of the 1st Division, made it to Nijmegen. The failed plan that had so many hopes pinned on it cost the lives, health, or freedom of 7,212 British paratroopers and 378 Polish soldiers from the 1st Separate Parachute Brigade out of 10,000 who went into battle. Those were the darkest days for the Red Devils. Indeed, the 1st British Parachute Division ceased to exist. Additionally, more than 3,500 soldiers from the British 30th Army Corps and nearly as many American paratroopers were killed or wounded. The total number of losses reached 15,000, and the Wehrmacht destroyed or captured nearly all of the heavy weapons used by the British landing forces. The German forces at Arnhem suffered a total loss of 3,300 men, a third of whom were killed. Due to the failure of the operation dubbed Market Garden in September 1944, and the obvious strategic failure of that operation, Montgomery acknowledged in his post-war memoirs, in 1944, Berlin was lost to us because we failed to formulate a good operational strategy in August after the Normandy victory. This was due both to objective circumstances and to a number of errors and omissions made during the planning of the operation by high command and technical services. As a result, the plans of General Roy Urquhart, commander of the British 1st Airborne Forces, were disrupted due to the lack or inactivity of necessary communications equipment off-road vehicles, special weapons, and SAS-type equipment at the landing site. This deprived the troops of the maneuver and combat coordination that are the main advantages of airborne forces over numerically and technologically superior enemy forces. In general, the Allied forces clearly underestimated the enemy and overestimated their own capabilities.